welcome to the Lions Podcast. I am Matt Brown. That is Stephen Andrus. This is the U.S. Open Golf Edition of the podcast. As always, everything we do, absolutely free. So if you're watching this on the Twitter machine and you haven't already followed the account, I don't know why you wouldn't, but go ahead and do that. And if, of course, you're watching this after the fact in the recorded version of the podcast or even over on YouTube, go ahead, subscribe, rate, review, do all those different little things that people beg you to do whenever they are trying to get your support of the content. So Steven, uh, we are heading to the Los Angeles country club. I did a little recon work though. It is though. It is not, um, wide, widely known. There are sources that say it's about 400, 500 K initiation fee, uh, (laughs) for the Los Angeles country club though. After you get the initiation fee in, it is only about $30,000 a year, but the, but they uh they get you on the front end to make sure that you are uh that you are worthy of being part of the Los Angeles Country Club. So about about four hundred five hundred k clip up front. I mean, are we talking like FBI background check here to make sure you're worthy? Is that is that how? No, no, no. Is? I think they just want to make sure that you are not going to be bringing you know your friends out there who are going to be shotgunning white claws on uh on the first tee box and stuff. You know, <laughs> they want to at least make sure that that isn't going to happen until the back nine or something. But yes, it is. Uh, in their it's defense, expensive, it's Matt, exclusive. Yeah, I mean, in their defense, it's not worth driving in Los Angeles anyway. So why not just drop thirty k on a golf membership? It is, it is expensive. Uh, it is exclusive. And it's the first time that we've seen this course basically, you know, ever. I mean, you can go back to 1940 if you want to for a professional event and you can go to some collegiate events. It's not going to play the same as it did at these collegiate events. And most of these guys that did play in these collegiate events, it's a tired narrative to point at those guys. If you talk about Max Homa, who has the course record here, he hasn't played there in a, in a decade. He literally was <laughs> like, yeah, no, I haven't played there in a decade. So like all of this stuff, it doesn't matter. Uh, any of those things. So let's just try and handicap this course the best we can. It's a par 70. It is 7,423 yards, though. That will vary throughout the course of this tournament. Some of these pin placements and or tee boxes can really uh, make this course play vastly different and at much different yardages out there. There are, it's a unique setup. It is five par threes, three par fives and 10 par fours. So we do have that going on wide fairways, big greens, but going to be hard going to be fast. I'm talking about both. That's that's for the fairways. That's also for the greens as well. We got a Bermuda rough in a U.S. Open, Stephen, for the first time since 2005. And the reason I bring this up is because, you know, one thing people love to do, and we've done this every single year, is have the guys go out and they drop a ball into the rough at the U.S. Open. Well, and it disappears and you can't see it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now that's not going to be the case this year. You go in, you drop it, you can see it. It's about three and a half, four inches of rough, but it's Bermuda rough. And you can ask any person on the PGA Tour whether they would take six inch rough of any other kind of grass or three inch rough of Bermuda and they would take the six inch of every other type (laughs) outside of the Bermuda because Bermuda, the way that it's sticky and the way that it will grip the ball in the face of the club whenever they're trying to hit out of this thing, it's going to make for some very interesting shots because they're not going to know exactly how it's going to come out and they're not going to know exactly how far it's going to fly. And they certainly aren't going to know how high it's going to come out either. And so basically we are, even though the rough is not near as long as U S opens in his, in past, um, in past U S opens, it's going to be just as dangerous, if not more dangerous. Here's the key, though, Matt. The fairways aren't less than 20 yards wide like we saw at winged foot, right? Like It's penal to be in the rough, but the fairways are more than double what we saw at winged foot a couple of years ago. We've had three straight years with a winning score with six under par. So hitting the fairways theoretically should be easier at this course, which could potentially bring a bigger list of potential winners into play here than what we've seen in recent U.S. Opens. You and I have been debating offline about whether or not we care about driving distance. I actually disagree with that statement. So yeah, yeah, so I actually disagree with that statement. You you do. Tell me why. Okay, because because numerically that's what it is. But why why do you why do you disagree? Because it's going to be hard and fast. And so even if you hit a fairway, if you don't hit it in the right spot, okay, it's there's tons of there's tons of undulations, there's tons of elevation changes and things like that. It's a bit like Augusta. It will either either roll right off, or you're going to find yourself rolling into a position where you might as well you'd be almost be better off in the first cut at a better angle than whatever. I, I I don't believe 
I don't believe that necessarily the correlation between being able to hit the fairways in this particular tournament is going to necessarily equal better scores. I think being mm-hmm. able to hit the fairways where you need to hit them is going to equate better scores. But I think there's going to be a lot of guys that have high fairway percentages, but because of where the ball ends up, they have almost blind or impossible approach shots. And it's not really going to translate into lower scores. Again, just in my opinion, from what I've gathered from the flyovers, from the people who have actually played this course before to all of the stuff that I'm hearing just from the players in the uh, in the practice rounds. So let me see then if you would agree with this statement, because this is something I've I've seen and read from people who are on the grounds there where executing creativity will very much be rewarded this week in terms of playing a lot of different types of shots. Yes, no, for sure, which is why I have de-emphasized length altogether, right? Like I have I don't think length is going to play at all in in this. Um listen, it's always better to be longer, but this to me is going to be much more positional off of the tee than it's going to be length off of the tee. You want to have certain angles into these holes in order to be able to have any shot whatsoever at, at, at birdie. Right. And like, there are some, there are holes that are going to be scorable, right? There's going to be some that it's like par is going to be the best you can hope for. Yeah, it's but one of the more be- interesting scorecards I've seen in recent years for us yeah. opens. I mean, there's a, there's a par three towards the closing stretch here that might play under 100 yards. I mean, these we are going to have professional golfers at a major championship at a chip and putt basically on one of these holes, which is really cool. But then also one third of the holes are between 450 and more than 500 yard par fours. So we're getting a really eclectic mix of holes here, I think. No, no, absolutely. And that is one of the things where we have, um, you know, it it was funny because they were talking to, to Matt Fitzpatrick about this and he was saying like, they're equally as intimidating because you never play 280 yard par threes where the greens protected. So you have to fly it if you want to, or you, or you have to lay up like there literally might be layups on this, on a par three. Like that actually might be a real thing that we see this week. But he said, it's equally as intimidating lining up over a 90 yard par three, because you don't play (laughs) anything anywhere, even close to that on tour, right? Like, yeah, you have 90 yard shots and stuff, but like, this is after you've already teed off and you feel good about the hole. And you know, like, like, no, this is like, you're sitting on a tee box and you're 90 yards away. This is something we, he's like something we never work on. We never practice because there's none of these little super short par threes on tour. And so he's like, he he was, he was trying to say that, you know, honestly, both are going to be pretty, pretty daunting of a task. Right. And I think that's something that's why I am fascinated by this event i am looking forward to this event maybe more than i have any event in the last several years because this country club by the way top 10 course in the world by all the rankings that there are out there so like you're going to tune in and you're going to go oh my god i can't believe we've never seen this course before and then they're going to do an aerial shot and you're going to see that it's dead center in the middle of freaking (laughs) los angeles like it's isn't like one of those deals where you know it's like oh this is an awesome course that they made off of this crazy plot of land somewhere it's like it's dead center wilshire boulevard is like right there like i mean this is this is yeah it's like it's dead center in the middle of the city so i mean it's it's crazy crazy wild what we're going going to see with all this now listen i'm making assumptions and you're making assumptions and that's the only way that's the only thing we can do here going in again we have not seen this course on a professional level since 1940 throw it out the window we haven't seen this course like even moderately recently except for collegiate events throw that out the window as well because that's the one they've redone some of the stuff on the course anyway and two it's not going to play the same for a collegiate event as it is on a a u.s open so like all that stuff didn't take into account at all so i mean this is we're learning this course along with the pro golfers who are learning this course and and steven you know i know we say this all the time but, you know, you might want to keep a bullet or two for live betting once you see this course and figure out like, oh, man, what I thought is not right at all. Right. I mean, or what I or the way that I strategic like went about the strategy of building a card is not right at all. I mean, hell, I had to I had to learn what a Baronka even was. Right. I mean, like, I mean, if you're by the way, do not play a drinking game where Baronka is part of the deal because every <laughs> single commentator is going to u- utilize every opportunity possible to say the word Baronka. So like, just don't even, don't even do it. By the way, it's just like a dried out riverbed 
but it does add some intrigue to this course, Stephen. There's no water hazards at all on this course, but this Barranca basically can play four different ways, which is what is super interesting about this. There are going to be parts of it that are super dried out, and it's going to be basically like hitting off concrete. There are going to be some parts that are actually loosened up a little bit and be more like playing out of a sand trap. And vegetation can actually grow in this as well, right? So you might be on some sort of little weird patch of shrubbery or something, or you could be behind a damn full on bush. Like there could be like a little bush in these things and stuff. So like there are four different aspects of this whole Barranca situation, which could make this course play really, really hard because what if a, what if you hit a Barranca and that basically means it's bogey at best, right? And it might be double or triple coming into play. Yeah, I love that because if there's water, there's only one thing to do. You take a drop, you have a penalty stroke. And yeah. I think some of these guys will be debating whether or not to take the usual ball on a hazard penalty stroke or risk trying to hit it out of the Bronca and not getting out or being in a worse situation if they fail. Or blading it or, shot. yeah, yeah. So that could bring some big numbers into play here if, if they don't just take their medicine and take the drop and get back onto more solid land there. I think all of that strategy makes this so fun, and it's made me just want to have a, a model and a ranking system that has the most well-rounded golfer possible because yeah. that's that's just what we're, we're kind of dealing with here. We know it's a major championship. Some courses we can emphasize more uh, stats than others, and this one – I just want every single aspect of the game of golf covered in who I'm trying to pick this week. So from a betting aspect, guys, it's 156 golfers and 60 in ties make the cut. So you might be thinking like, oh, man, that's going to be a tight cut. I don't know if that changes my strategy at all. But keep in mind, this is an open. So there's going to be 25 or 30 players in this field that I'm not going to say are drawing dead but are pretty close to drawing dead. So like, even though it is 156 people, like a full field, I'm treating it more like an invitational where we kind of see that 120 ish, 125 ish type player field, because a lot of these guys, it's great stories that they went out and qualified. We had a record turnout, by the way, for the amount of people who tried to qualify for the U S open this year, but you do have about 25 or 30 spots, Steven, that, you know, it's sub 1% chance that these guys can do anything. And, you know, I would say basically zero chance that they're going to be able to win this thing. Uh, Maxwell Moldovan, Gun <laughs> Cherenkel, Ben Carr. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's so just keep that in mind when you're handicapping. Yes, it is 60 in ties. So it is a shorter cut than we're used to. But also, we're going to have, like I said, 20 to 30 guys who are basically drawn dead when it comes to all this 39 of the top 40 in the official world golf ranking. The only one missing is Will Salatoris because of injury when it comes down to it. So Steven, I'll start with you here. When you started putting together your model, like you said, we had kind of a, a debate off offline about how we were going to go about doing this. What stats did you find important? What did you really, really weigh heavily? And what did you find yourself maybe, um, maybe, finding yourself a little less heavy on than maybe the general consensus out there. Initially I did have strokes gained off the tee. I also ran one with driving distance and that was kind of just me listening to you and saying, you know, checking my pride at the door and understanding that we're dealing with a course with a lot of unknowns. And uh, obviously I can be wrong in my range of outcomes. I'm not too prideful to say that. So um, I do value distance still because if you're in the rough, I'd rather be closer to the hole in the rough than way back in in the rough um, to at least increase my chances of still getting up near the green or on the green. Um, on top of that, strokes gain on approach, but also adding a layer of that with long iron play on an proximity mm -hmm. more than 200 yards. So that, that took up about a quarter of the model for me. But on top of that, I mean, we're looking at strokes gained around the green. Um, the PGA Championship, I had sand saves in there as my scrambling stat because there are a lot of bunkers around the greens. At this course, it seems like it's much more than just bunkers. There's a lot of runoff areas. Um, I won't say links and some style. of that super sticky Bermuda as well. Yeah. Super sticky, kind of like what we saw at, at Memorial uh, and at the RBC last week where your, your club face could get stuck in there. So the around the green game is going to have to be a lot more diverse this week. So stroke skiing around the green, I think is the best way to cover that situation. Um, beyond so that, this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
it, well, it's it's kind of like the debate we were having was, you know, look, typical U.S. Opens, and and this is not a knock on the USGA or anything, but like typical U.S. Opens, at least in the last five or six years, you could just bomb and gouge the courses, right? I yep. mean, they it was like, hey, yeah, we're going to grow up this rough, but like, you know, if you want to cut a corner and you want to do all this stuff, like it was, it, it was basically, you know, who can hit it the furthest and who has the strength to muscle it out of the rough, you know, and I don't think it's going to play that way this week. Like, I think that you're looking at a tournament in which if you try to go the Bryson Rory route, which is just muscle it down there and go from there again, the Bermuda Bermuda rough is going to make it very difficult for these guys to get thing, get anything close to the pin. Like whenever they're hitting their approach shot, it's just going to be very hard. You're not going to be able to control how far you hit it, any sort of spin, anything like that. And so for me, I just went very heavy emphasis on T to green stuff, like good drive percentage, like guys that aren't going to be spraying it all over the place. Like I, I really want a dude who is going to play this course like more like chess than checkers, right? Like I want a guy who's like, you know what? If I can just get it to 90 right there, I'm going to have the perfect angle into this hole. And yeah, I mean, sure. I'd rather be 320, but if I can go 290 and hit that on the top of this ridge, like I want to, as opposed to trickling down into this ravine where I'm going to have a blind approach shot, I'm going to be much better off than everybody else. And, and I do truly believe that that is something that is, uh, is going to be super beneficial this week. So again, I have no distance whatsoever in my model mm -hmm. and I really put a heavy emphasis on guys that I believe are just kind of really, 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 really strategic kind of type players. Yeah, I think it's going to make for an interesting conversation at the top of the board here then when we get to it. The, the only other stats I'll mention here that I got in, I mentioned that one third of the holes are par fours that are 450 to more than 500 yards. So I have a, a decent amount of the model in there, about 15% on scoring from those distances. Um, I also included short par fives in there to see who scores best because that falls into that same yardage, even though they're being called par fours on a couple of the holes this week. So um 225 plus par threes this week i even included short par fours under 350 yards because i do think you know the the undulations are going to make it so that some of these par threes really aren't playing 280 270 from what we're hearing with the elevation changes it, it might only be 240 uh but i want to see who's hitting those short par fours as well so um to me i would still want the guys on these longer holes who are taking irons and shorter irons into these greens as opposed to the guys who might have to hit woods or hybrids into these so i did a couple of different things i did bogey avoidance i need guys that are okay just kind of taking their medicine and understanding yep. that some of these holes are just going to be par holes like it and you just understand that it's par at best and that's what i'm going to be shooting for i don't need someone super aggressive on holes that don't call for it I also did put in birdie or better percentage because the guys on the holes that are able to be gotten, I do want those guys that are aggressive. Like I want yep. those guys who are going to go in and say like, you know what? I'm going to target hole X, Y, Z and A, B and C. And those six holes are gettable, right? Like those after playing a couple practice rounds, like those holes are gettable to me. And I'm going to be aggressive as hell and try to score on those holes. And if I can score on those holes, then that might be good enough to win this tournament. And so I, I did do some birdie or better percentage in there. A couple of the other things that I thought was fairly interesting that I did include in the model that I don't normally do, because there is going to be, I, I, again, these greens, they're pretty big. And if they do hold, this was kind of more of a tiebreaker type situation for me, but uh, shout out to, we build models at Fantasy National, Rick Rungood, Data Golf, all these, you know, all these places. We're not coding the stuff ourselves, so it, give, give credit where credit's due. Sure. One of the stats that you can put in uh, is approach putting, right? Which is basically how good are you at lag putting? Yeah. Like, how good are you at making sure you don't, making sure you give yourself a makeable second putt, right? And uh, so I put in some lag putting here because I, I these are big ass greens, right? And if they do hold and it's not a bunch of runoff, like I kind of think there will be, but if I'm wrong and there is, I want to know who's that dude that when he's 35, 40, 50, 60 feet away, right? 
is giving himself a putt that he's going to be able to make when you know come come that uh come that second putt. And so did throw that in the model as well. I mean, I'm sure you and I pretty much the same when it comes to the top, very top of everything. I mean, listen, it's gonna be your Schefflers and Roms and Cantleys and and Hovlins and stuff of the world. Were were there any was there anybody that showed up in yours that was just a, a complete and utter outlier at the top? Wyndham Clark was interesting to me. I know I think I suspect he was kind of near the top 10 or in the top 10 for you too, right? Uh, 15 ish range okay. for me. Yeah. 15 ish range for me as opposed to 10, but yeah, 15 ish range for me. So this is a situation that typically tends to happen for me. There's always at least one name that's popping kind of near the top uh, of the model. that doesn't seem that seems weird. Right. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying necessarily like just go run to back him in a major championship at long odds. I mean, you know, if you go to the lines.com or the U.S. Open page, it tells you the odds of the last few winners here. And you have to really dig deep to find a guy that was more than 50 to one. I mean, I think Gary Woodland's yeah. the, really the last example of that. Most guys are 30 to one or shorter. So but it, it at least highlights a guy who um, might be able to make some noise in the placement market. He's done really well on tour this year, kind of a breakout year. Um you know, near the top of the tour in terms of strokes gained tee to green, strokes gained on approach. And, you know, what's interesting to me, Matt, is that we're going to talk about Scotty Scheffler here in a minute. And the big bugaboo right now is just his putting. And if yeah. he's going to have another bad putting week, I want to have somebody who can take advantage of that on the greens. And Wyndham Clark falls into that category as well as somebody who's been a pretty solid putter this year. So the guys I'm the guys that I'm going to take a shot on 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 Scheffler with better be able to putt this week. That's what that's a big theme for me. Yeah. So let's just I don't know your betting card, but I'm just going to you know, I kind of know your betting style. So we'll just mm-hmm. start at the very top here. I imagine you're not on Scotty Rom, Kepka, Rory, any of those super short guys, right? I'm going to surprise you, man. I am on Scotty, but I'm not all in because, you know, mm-hmm. if if. Typically, the way I like to bet golf is three units to win twenty four, and that's going to take up my entire betting card if it's Scotty Scheffler. So yeah, I'm and, all- and, and I mean it's it's worth pointing out though, like you mentioned, like it's worth pointing out with Scotty Scheffler, if he can even putt at level, he doesn't even have to gain strokes putting. Like if right. he can just putt at level, he's going to win this tournament by three or four strokes. Like like 100%. he is on a historic tee to green, like stuff we haven't seen since like the Tiger age, but yep. he's better than Tiger. Like it's better statistics than Tiger. And yeah. like, it is crazy, ridiculous how good he would be if he was just even putting level. And so we're talking about a dude that doesn't even have to gain strokes on the field putting, which by the way, when you win a tournament, you typically are gaining strokes on the field putting because you need your flat stick to work in order to win these tournaments. That's not Scotty's case. If Scotty had just putted level for the last four tournaments he played, he would have won them all. He would have won every single one of them. So that is the, that's the thing about him, you know, this week is, is, he if he if the putter is even lukewarm as long as it's just not cold he's going to win slightly below average and i think he wins this week you know it's it is so historic what he's doing right now t to green you mentioned the tiger woods like situation he has been at this point better than a lot of those tiger woods seasons that were post 2000 and the only one that hasn't been as good it's the best t to green season so far by a pga tour player since tiger in 2006 and in that season, Tiger only played 14 events and won eight of them. So yes. it's a minor miracle, like you say, that he hasn't won one of his last four events where he's finished top five in each because he's been 10. By, plus- by the way, guys, yeah. if you were not golf betting back then or if you weren't betting back then, so to give you a <laughs> point yeah, tell of the odds of Tiger in, in those years. So Scotty Scheffler's 657, 750, whatever it is, something like that, right? So you have the numbers on Scheffler where you're getting nearly seven to one, seven and a half to one, something like that for him to win. When Tiger was on this run, the lowest odds, I remember him being minus money to win a full field tournament. Like I remember a <laughs> minus 110 somewhere along the way. Tiger he was the field playing props. in majors where he would be like plus 210, plus 225 in majors, right? Like, like th- that is how ridiculous the run was. And the statistics, again, outside of the putting aspect, the T to green statistics for Scotty Scheffler this season are identical to better than what was going on with Tiger then. Yeah, I mean, 15-plus strokes gained T to green in his last three events. So, like, I'm going through the stats here of these other guys that are high in the model this week, Matt, and I'm like, all right, well, who's coming close to Scotty in terms of T to green? 
Nobody right now. Yeah. Nobody's coming close to him. And the only reason, like you said, he's not winning is because he's had two really brutal putting weeks where he lost almost five strokes on the greens. And at the Memorial, he lost almost nine strokes on the greens, which is just insane. So he, he probably should have just put it with his driver. He would have been a better putter that week. So um, if, if I'm taking a shot at Scotty Scheffler and I'm assuming like T to green stuff is repeatable in golf. That is the, the stats that are most sticky week to week. It's the putting that can be variant. It can be changed from week to week with most golfers. That's why Colin Morikawa can go out and win a major and then not be able to hit the broad side of a barn on a green the next week. It's just, you don't know which week a guy is going to pop with the putter. So we can trust that Scotty Scheffler is going to be a force from T to green. If I'm we, going to, we beat. missed the boat yesterday. Mm -hmm. Rom had drifted to like 12 to one. Mm -hmm. It didn't last very long. Like I see, I saw a 12 50 for a, a hot minute and then it was gone. Like, look, whether you think Scotty is, is going to win the term or not, which I kind of do, but like, look, John Rom, if it wasn't for Scotty Scheffler, like John Rom's stats, by the way, are really damn good too. And by the way, he's won four times already. Right. You know, I mean like the, the, it, it, it really, really good. And by the way, if we're talking about just pure driver of the golf ball, John Rom, this course, if I believe that accuracy is going to be paramount this week, if we talk about a dude who actually is long and accurate, like super long and accurate, John Rom is that dude, right? Like John Rom is that guy when it comes to all of that. So I don't want to and say that this putt. is like the Scotty show and nobody else and that John Rom's on a different level than Scotty. Scotty is playing out of his mind right now, but John Rom is not that far behind. And it, it honestly would be the talk of all of this if we weren't literally watching almost history going on with what Scotty's doing. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if, if the other guys I'm considering are good T to green, but obviously not as good as Scotty, then they better be pretty good putters or pretty consistent putters, even though that is variant from week to week. Are they generally good putters? Are they generally gaining strokes on the green? So that's kind of how I attacked it. I do have Scotty, but for far less than the normal payout I would get. I kind of decided, okay, if Scotty wins, I'd be happy with a 16 unit payout. And that freed up some money for the rest of the card. And for the casual betters out there this week, take advantage of some of these money or bonus bets back on insurance if Scotty finishes top 10 at Bet Rivers, at top 20 at FanDuel, and you'll get the bonus bets back. That frees up some potential as well if you're assuming that. So that's kind of how I attacked me, it, Matt. You just reminded me of another tip here with all of this is if you are in one of the states that has the rest of country books or whatever, any of these bet boosts, like any of these boosts and odds boosts and whatever, I'll tell you, Use them on the favorites. Like, yeah. like it, 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 it's it, the, the value extra plus 300 is so at draft much games. higher to yeah. use them on one of the favorites than it is to like take a 50 to one to a 60 to one. Like that, that doesn't matter. Like what you want to be using is taking Scotty Scheffler from seven to 11 or seven to 12 or Rom from nine to 14 or what, like that is exponentially more value than it is to take a longer number and just make it bigger. Like that doesn't do you any good. So just be sure that you're using it correctly whenever you get these bet boosts. Yeah. So, so I do have a Scotty Scheffler ticket. It's not for the normal full payout I would get so that I can still have at least three or four more names on the card here at very long numbers, likely um, to try and to try and win this thing in the event that Scotty does have another putter meltdown. So let's, uh, I'll tell you the shortest guy on my card and we can start to kind of go through our cards here. Sure. We'll talk about some other guys along the way if we, if we need to, but, um, I the shortest guy on my card is Xander and, and look, I get it. He hadn't gotten it done. Um, that being said, we have had a new winner. Well, we've had a new major winner on tour every year for like the last 11 years or something like that. And, and you, you look at Xander where he shows up in your models you know, Steven, it's the thing with Xander and the reason I think that he doesn't get the same kind of praise and stuff that some of these other guys do. He doesn't do anything exceptionally well. He just does everything really well. Like he, he is not like the longest. He's not like the greatest with the irons. He's not the most spectacular putter. He's not a wizard around the greens from, from, from a chipping aspect. Like he doesn't do anything where it just completely wows you, but he is really really good at everything and like maybe on a course like this where again i'm of the mindset that the winner might could get to 10 under on this thing like i think we might get a double digit winner 
unlike these years where like, you know, they're struggling to make par. I think there are gettable holes so long as you can avoid the doubles that are there on some of the other holes, right? And like, that's going to be the big thing is, can you just scrape along, score on the scorable holes, and then just don't blow up on the holes that, you know, you 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 can blow up on. Um, and maybe this all culminates for Xander this week. The fact that he is just so incredibly well-rounded and just so good at everything, even though he's not great, at all this, maybe this is the type of course where you don't have to go super, super low. We're not talking 16, 17 under. It's not the complete grind of the two or three under type situation. It's kind of a perfect blend of those two. And maybe this is finally where Xander puts it all together. He was no lower than fifth in any version of any model that I ran. On a typical tournament week, I probably would have had Xander on the card with you. He's played in six U.S. Opens. He's finished top 10 in five of them. Last year, his 14th place finish was his worst appearance in the U.S. Open. That's incredible for a U.S. Open track record. So if it wasn't for Scotty Scheffler just being literally Tiger Woods-like from tee to green, he probably would have made my card. So I, I can't knock you for that uh, whatsoever. So as we kind of move our way down the board, uh, Rory 14, Cantlay 16, Xander comes in right there in that sweet spot of like 18 to 20 a shop around. Um, Vic Hovland is the last one in that range. And then it's a pretty big jump to Hatton, Spieth, Smith, Homa, et cetera, et cetera. Are you on McElroy, Kepka, Cantlay, Hovland? Are you on any of those dudes? I'll say this, you know, we mentioned the, the first two majors on this podcast about the uncertainty of live guys. So at least we have two majors to go by at this point with these live guys. And if I was going to try and take somebody at the top of the board, not named Scotty Scheffler to try and beat Scotty. In my opinion, I think Brooks is the most obvious pick here. And I know we're getting ridiculously shorter odds than the 50 to one at the masters and, uh, you know, around the 30 to one at the PGA championship. But this is about what his odds were in his prime before his injury anyway. And if you look at his PGA championship performance, 14.6 strokes gained T to green. He's the only guy in this field, maybe Rom once in a blue moon, but in terms of the majors, um, Brooks Kepka now twice has shown the ability to match what Scotty Scheffler has done tee to green. And he's a historically above average putter gaining strokes on the, on the greens. So that to me would be my first choice at the top of a non Scotty Scheffler bet. Um, but further down the board here, you know, there's another another live guy that I had a hard time ignoring. And it really came down. It was a it was a good old fashioned Jordan Spieth versus Cameron Smith debate for me. And from what I understand, you wound up on the Jordan Spieth side and I wound up on the Cam Smith side. So you go give your Jordan Spieth take and then I'll give my uh, my Cam Smith take. Yeah, real quick on the other guys, um, I'm actually kind of fading Rory. I'm going to look to fade Rory in this tournament. Again, I don't think that the style that Rory plays, and this kind of goes to the whole, my also, like, the the Bryson DeChambeau take, which I have a I have a to miss the cut bet on Bryson DeChambeau in this mm. tournament. Like, I don't think that their style is going to play here. Like, I don't think that you're going to be able to just hit it 350 and just just lot knock it out of this rough and, and play the same way that some of these guys are going to be hitting the fairways. So I'm actually on a Rory fade. I'm on a DeChambeau fade with all that. There's nothing bad for me to say about Cantlay. It's just, I just don't like the number attached, right? Like, so he struggled at the beginning of the year, but the thing was is, so as you guys well know, all these guys are sponsored in every single facet of their games. His sponsorship had run out with whoever he was playing from an iron standpoint. He was in a he was a he was a free agent. He was testing out different irons to see which one suited his game, et cetera, et cetera. Whenever he picked one up, if you look at his super recent like super recent data as opposed to kind of the whole season data, he's right back where he's been for the last week. Why do I mean, why do you guys do this, Matt? Like I don't understand. I don't like know. if I had the talent to to contend in major championships and and win PGA tour events, I'd never change my clubs ever. Like Tiger Woods <laughs> used the same damn putter for every one of his majors. Like, I, well, because I, the I thing is, is, they pay you, they pay you a year what it would what you would win winning three majors. Their clubs, to just right? That's like, fine. To, to like I've the, made my money. I'll still use, use the clubs the stuff, for free. You know? Whatever. So, um, uh, Vic, I just Ugh. don't like the number attached to Vic. Like, yeah. I honestly think too that while he has been better around the greens uh, this season than he was the last few seasons, he's still not good and. I wonder if these 
greens might because there's going to be so many different types of light. Like we talk about, there's 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 rough around the green. Sometimes there's going to be like these super deadpan lights. Sometimes there's going to be these baroncas. So I, I just don't know if he'll be able to handle it to to kind of get and it like done. he's he's vastly improved out of the sand. But yes. there's like we said, there's more than sand here, and and yeah. we've still seen some issues there. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So it gets to this next level, and this is where I I'm on Spieth, and I actually think that Spieth is probably my favorite bet, um, of the tournament. I guess what I should go back and say with this, Stephen, just while we're as a caveat, mm-hmm. if you're playing one and done, and you still have Brooks Kepka available, because by the way, you're only allowed to play them four times a year as it is anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's the no doubt you play him here because you it, it's much more valuable to hold on to any of the PGA tour guys that you can use anytime the rest of the year than than to not use a guy who you can only use four times a year who atu- who appears to be on like the greatest heater that he's been on since he was you know one of the very best players in the world so that's an aside if you're playing one and done like Kepka should be at the top of your list if you haven't used him already um for scarcity and the fact that he's just playing great golf, but Jordan Spieth under the radar, man, he's been playing really good. He's been driving the ball really good. And weirdly enough, the only thing that's been holding him back, he's actually been, he's actually been kind of mediocre around the greens, which has been the thing that has been his, his bread and butter, his whole career. I think that is something you can easily just fix. If you're at the caliber of Jordan Spieth, especially when you've been one of the very best at that, the entire for your entire career, probably just some sort of little tweak that needs to be made somewhere along the way. But the fact, what I really like about Jordan, he's not spraying the driver anymore. He's long, he's straight. And more than anything, he's clubbing down when he needs to, and he's playing smarter golf. And I really like that about Jordan under the radar fellas. And the reason I say this is because he hadn't won, which is why you probably are kind of like, what are you talking about? Jordan Spieth? T6 at the Waste Management, T4 at the Arnold Palmer, T3 at the Valspar, T4 at the Masters, second outright at the RBC Heritage, T5 at the Memorial. This guy has been playing at a very, very high level. And so long as he can kind of find a little bit around the greens and and with the flat stick that he had, you know, uh, let's call it 18 months ago or something like that, I think this course fits Jordan Spieth very, very, very well. You keep hearing all the people who have played this thing talk about that you need creativity. There's basically no more creative player on P- on the PGA Tour than Jordan Spieth. And so um, still available at 30 to 1 at DraftKings out there. I think that number is really, really juicy and uh, really like me some Spieth this week. I sat there. I looked at Spieth. I looked at Cam Smith. And... I can't argue everything you said about Jordan Spieth, and I wonder if he wouldn't be top five in the model this week if we take away a couple of those weeks where he was clearly injured and and, mm-hmm. and dealing with some stuff. Comes back healthy, top five at the Memorial, 10.3 strokes gained tee to green. The tiebreaker for me was the putter. Um, and I, I feel like I'm contradicting myself a little bit here because we don't know any given week if a guy's going to be able to putt, but – and and, and – Spieth has had hot putter weeks, but it's been four consecutive weeks where he has lost strokes on the greens. And that was a concern for me if I'm trying to beat Scotty Scheffler this week. So Cam Smith, for me, one of the best putters on earth, maybe the best putter on earth. And for me, if you look at the the big tournaments where he has succeeded, it's been places with wide fairways have been a little bit more forgiving off of the tee. And I know we've had that discussion where placement matters here for, for I'll Cam tell you Smith. why. That's why he got eliminated for me, buddy. Like okay. you, you said you like length. Well, he's short mm-hmm. and I like accuracy and he ain't accurate. So it's like, he doesn't <laughs> check either one of the boxes, right? Like for me, he ain't long and he ain't accurate. So admittedly, me, I am that was trusting, like an instant scratch off for me. Yeah. Admittedly, I am trusting that he hits these wider than usual U S open fairways. Uh, he, he did very well at St. Andrews, which basically has no rough. Uh, he does well at Augusta, which basically has no rough. So I'm hope I'm, I, I totally concede that he needs to hit the fairways here, but if he does, then that iron and short game can really take over. You could almost hedge a bet on Cam Smith by like betting him to miss the cut. Like, (laughs) cause like if he's, cause if he's, if he's spraying it, he, he's going to miss the cut. Like, I mean, like it's just going to be double after double after double after double. Like, I mean, like, so if he's, I mean, we have seen when you talk about there are misses on the PGA tour and then there are Cam Smith misses. Like, I mm-hmm. mean, like we are talking missing by like 
40, 50 yard, like, like some of the most epic misses you've ever seen off the tee. And so, I mean, if, it happened in the, the PGA case, championship. He lost two and a half strokes off the tee in the PGA championship, still finished top 10 because he was so good with his irons and his putter. So, well, to be fair, he had that one low round in, on Sunday. Like it, it, it was, it, he had he, the low he round. He wasn't really in contention, but yeah. he, this is also a guy who admittedly has been trying to get back into form here after basically taking the yeah. off season off. So um, that, that was encouraging to me moving forward. As we move down the odds board for me, the next guy that I hit, and this is one that's been in the account for several weeks. I think if I had the cash out option, I probably would. I've got Max Homa. I know you have Max Homa as well. I do. I do. I'm not in love with it. Um, listen, could Max have figured out? Could Max have figured out? Look, he's 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 a smart dude. He's a student of the game. Has he been grinding his tape and figured out what's kind of been off with his game over the last month, month and a half? He probably has, right? And like, could he find it and go out here and look like the Max we saw at the beginning of the season? Absolutely, he could. I, I I'm not taking that away, but if if I'm if I've really been emphasizing that I want dudes that are playing well right now and I want dudes that are, you know, finding fairways and I won't do whatever, like he ain't doing any of that stuff. And so again, this was something I made like seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago. I, I you know, again, it's, it is what it is. It's in there. Would it shock me if he's in contention? It would not. But if I was starting the card anew today, I probably wouldn't have him in there. I agree with you. I, I will say if you if you take a larger sample size, last 50 rounds for me, and you turn on difficult uh, scoring conditions, he improves a little bit. But that's that's kind of the knock here, right? The, the recent form is not good for Max Homa. Is that just because he's playing on courses at different parts of the country that don't suit him, and now he's back to his West Coast-friendly confines? I don't know, but I agree with you. I actually um, texted a buddy, you know, we – we like to just kind of root together on some squad bets for mm -hmm. some of these major championships. And he had the home of one. And I was like, can you check to see if we can get a full state cash out on this? And it wasn't available, but if it was, yeah. I think we would have cashed it out. Well, I mean, you know, the other thing just about the home narrative and I just, I, I just, just to point out, and again, I love max, probably my favorite golfer to watch. Like, uh, but just, you know, the thing was, is, Hey, watch out. You get max back on that West coast POA and whatever, blah, blah. Well, the, yeah, these are bent grass greens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, these are these are bent grass greens, right? On this in the, at this course, so it's not even kind of fitting that narrative either, right? And so, just something like I said, I, I probably wouldn't be in. So as I head down the board, next guy that I have on is, is Colin Morikawa. Took him at thirty eight, added some more at forty this morning. Um, look, Stephen, this is one of those things. He was two off the lead at the Memorial, and again, being a smart guy, right? Two off the lead at the Memorial. He knew it is not worth me risking not being able to play at the U.S. Open and not being able to compete at some of these other events by messing with my back. He woke up with a little bit of back spasms and said, I'm donezo. If he goes on to win that tournament or even finish second in that tournament, like, he didn't have to win it. You ain't finding no 40 to 1 on Colin Morikawa heading into this tournament. You ain't finding no 38 to 1 or whatever and all these different, uh, different, different numbers that are out there on Colin. You're looking more in that like low twenties type range is where he would be it, had he won that tournament and or even gotten you know runner up in that tournament. I think we got a little bit of a break here that he's kind of out of sight, out of mind for the last few weeks. If you look, we talk about we think guys are going to have to hit a bunch of long irons. There is not a better long iron player in the game of golf than Colin Morikawa. If you look on the super long iron approach shots, he is number one in the field. He's number one in the field by by a wide margin. Like he that is his bread and his butter. And by the way, on those little short shots that we're talking about that some of these holes we think are also going to have that kind of 100 to 125 bucket. He's also number one in the field in that as well. So he's great with the super long and he's great with the super short. He's actually 10th in this field in good drive percentage over the last 24 rounds as well. And I talked about that lag putting that I'm talking about. Listen, Colin Morikawa is not going to put the lights out a lot, but one of the things that he has improved on at least a little bit, he's 17th in this field in the lag putting. So while he might not make a bunch of the putts the first time, he's at least not leaving himself impossible second putts, and he's at least making those as well. So Morikawa, I think the number is off on him. I, I think this is good. Look, is there a chance that he could wake up one of these mornings with back spasms again? Absolutely. We're gamblers. That's what we do. I will assume the risk uh, with one of the best golfers in the world, specifically one of the best long iron players in the world. I don't question his ability to contend. The Masters played longer than any Masters in history, and he still finished top 10. 
I question his ability to win. And part of that to me is more often than not, he's a, he's a bad putter. Um, and I, He's been playing well, but he's not been playing T.D. Green, Scotty Scheffler well. He's not been playing peak Rom, T.D. Green well. So that's why he didn't make my card. And admittedly, I love Colin Morikawa. He's the reason I have a golf bankroll when I started after the pandemic. Yeah. So I love the guy. Um, he, it, it just, I understand your logic. I can't argue against it. But when I start my card with Scotty Scheffler, Morikawa is not going to make the cut. Yeah, for what it's worth, and data golf isn't certainly the end-all be-all or anything like that, but data golf actually has Ricky Fowler as a better chance of winning this tournament than Colin Morikawa. That's kind of how their numbers have have panned out here. Um, what does the rest well of your card right look now. like? I'm, I'm just at longer shot, guys, after this, and, and yep. really, I, I sprinkle outrights on all of the guys that I like, but really, these are more placement market dudes for me, like guys that I'm going to be much, much higher in the placement market than I am in the outrights. Is there anybody else that you feel really confident in from an outright perspective we're gonna have to have a uh, a gentleman's wager here on bryson DeChambeau because you bet him to miss the cut and he made my outright card because i do value distance still this week and i might go down well, in flames on that but we'll see i will either be made to look like an idiot or i'll be look, made to look like a genius because i don't think you'll be able to bomb and gouge this course however if you can then he's going to have a huge leg up in in this over that because obviously nobody's longer than him I just like the idea that on some of these approaches and some of these long par threes, he's going to be taking a shorter club than the rest of the field, which means he's going to be able to put a little bit more um, arc on it, maybe hold the green better than, than other players. So I, I like that. And he was a complete disaster for a year or so. And then he shows up at the PGA championship and he finishes top five. And he does so with not only his off the tee numbers, but he also gained 4.3 strokes on approach. And we know historically he's typically an above average putter as well, which that so let me tell you about the PGA championship and why I don't like those numbers as reasons to back Bryson DeChambeau. Okay. Because the way that that course set up, it didn't matter if you were two yards off the fairway or 25 yards off the fairway, you were still in the same rough and you were still mm -hmm. in the same stuff. So there was no penalty. He was he he is going to gain on the field no matter what, because even if guys are just barely, barely off the green, I mean, barely, barely off the fairway, they're coming out of the same stuff that he is when he's 20 yards uh, off off of the fairway. That's not the case here, right? Like if you are barely there is a first cut, there is a whatever and there and it does get more penal the further you miss. And so he is actually if I would have thought it through a lot better, that course fit a guy like Bryson DeChambeau amazingly right because there's no disadvantage for for him playing that style at all like right because like guys are just going to miss fairways it's going to happen you're not going to be on every single fairway but the thing is is you know it progressively gets worse the worse you miss but the way that it set up for the pga championship was no there was one miss and it was all bad <laughs> and like and so there was no advantage to to guys that you know barely miss fairways and things like that and so again i didn't think that through good enough I should have been on DeChambeau in that tournament. I should have thought that through a little bit better, but um, I think it does change pretty drastically here because it, you, it there is an advantage for keeping it closer on the fairway than it is like hitting it, hitting it super wide. Yeah. I, I just disagree with him being 50 to one or longer. Yeah, I think he's shorter than that now, but um, you know, I, I disagree with him being below some of the other guys that are above him. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll tweet out a little gentleman's bet here, maybe a, a top twenty or a top thirty on DeChambeau. Come up with some turns, and we'll have some fun. Something Data Golf has him at one hundred and fifty to one to win. Yeah, not surprised. Not surprised. Yeah. We'll see. Um, the, who else you got? Yeah. So, what's the rest of your card look like? Because, like I said, I, I can kind of blast through the rest of mine. Sure. W I mentioned Wyndham Clark, so I won't spend any time on him. I, I'm I also on Wyndham Clark as well. Love I'm it. more of a placement guy than Wyndham Clark. Do I think Wyndham Clark really has the firepower to win this? I think he could run as pure as humanly possible and maybe win this thing. I really like Wyndham Clark, like top 20 markets, top 30 markets, top 40 markets, stuff like that. Like that's where I'm really, really investing in him. But I do also have a sprinkle of an outright on him. I agree. Yeah, for me, it was an each way bet as well. So you get one fifth mm -hmm. of the odds up to seven places for the same odds that you typically would have to pay for a top five. So that's yep. that was attractive to me as well. Um, and finally, Eric Cole, who you first yes. mentioned way back at the Honda Classic. He was as long as 350 to one. Yeah, I know. Broke my Broke, heart. Oh, man, you would have retired after that oh, one. Oh, broke man. My heart. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're not no you're not uh you're over it though right you're over yeah it. I, am, I am but yeah i mean uh, he's on my card as well so we we share we share a couple of guys right i mean like i i i share him as well he's one of those guys um i'm investing in pretty heavily in placement markets and also Same. steven out there uh i don't know what the market is in a couple of different books i would say shop around but eric cole to make the cut i got a minus 150 if I think this dude can make a top, if I think his his ceiling is like a a top, almost top ten ish finish, top twenty ish finish, then he's you know sixty in ties. I will take that all day long. Minus one fifty for Eric Cole to make the cut. I have that in the account as well. Second at the Honda, we talked about that heartbroken, but dude, twenty seventh at the Players T five at Mexico Open, T twenty three at the Byron Nelson, T fifteen at the PGA, T twenty four at the Memorial. Just last week he was T six up at Canada. Uh, this is a guy that just kind of came out of nowhere and has really, really played consistent golf. And um, I, I like his chances this week on a course like this. Yeah, I fired some lunch money on him every which way. I, I got him 125 to one for first round leader because any given round, he could just go low. It breaks the course record at the RBC Canadian on Sunday to go from like T30 up to T6. So um, on top of that, the way I did it, I kind of laddered it. So I have, you know, top 40, top 20, top 10, top five. If he finishes no better than top 40, then I'm profiting half a unit. But if he finishes top five, then I'm looking at a five unit profit on that. So that's kind of what I'm doing mm -hmm. with him. Last guy on my card, um, is Mito Pereira. Uh, this is shout out to Rick Gaiman and his site, Rick run good. He has live data on there mixed in with European data mixed in with PGA tour data, all the things like that. And so this was a numbers play because Mito Pereira was very high in every version of, of every model that I ran. Like he has been playing really consistently over on live and, um, I just at a guy that is north of a hundred to one and a guy that has been there and nearly had a major championship without a meltdown. Um, I went ahead and pulled the trigger on him again, just trusting the model here, trusting some of the numbers that are showing up for him. So, I mean, my outright card, Xander Spieth, Homa, which we already talked about the whole Homa situation, Morikawa, and then the kind of longer bomb guys that I really like more from a placement market standpoint, but I do want to have at least a sprinkle on Wyndham Clark, Mito Pereira, and Eric Cole. Anybody you're fading playing against? Well, yeah, Di uh, Bryson, Rory, like those two guys I'm going to be betting against. I already got the Bryson to miss the cut. I'm going to be trying to bet against Rory and head to heads, but I'm letting those marinate a little bit because I think with the good finish last week and all the, like, I think casual betters are going to want to back Rory. So I'm kind of letting those sit for a little while and see if I can get better numbers. From a placement market standpoint, I have a top 20 on Justin Rose. I have a top 30 on Russell Henley, a top 30 on Siwoo Kim, and then a top 40 on Eric Cole as well. Yeah, as, as we mentioned, I'll have placement bets on all those guys. But uh, Siwoo, Russell Henley, hugely, hugely popular in every version of the model that I ran. Doesn't surprise. They find a lot of fairways. They're really they're good with the irons, all the stuff that I prioritized this week. So no shock that they are going to climb in the model. And really, the Justin Rose stuff is more the recent form model that I ran. If you, if you go like really short-term data, Justin Rose playing some of the best golf he's played in quite some time, actually. Now, not willing to say that he can win the thing outright, but a, a plus money top 20 on Justin Rose, especially if you can get it at a book that that uh, doesn't dead heat you. Uh, I, I really like that as well. I'm going to give you one more bet for the last major of the year to try and get ahead of some line movement I think is coming. And it's Victor Hovland at Royal Liverpool. There's still a 25 to one out there on him. And this is a guy who has played well at Lynx golf um, over the past few years in the open championship T4 last year at St. Andrews and T12 the year before T7, T2 in his last two majors at the Masters of PGA Championship playing the best golf of his career. And I think he's most suited to win the open championship. So I, if he's, if he's shorter than 20 to one here, I'd be shocked if he's not shorter than 20 to one at the open next month. Guys, if you joined us live, thanks. Appreciate it. And uh, if you're catching this on the podcast form or the video form, as always really do appreciate any support you can give us. Everything we do is free. So it's free to support us by just hitting the pause button. If you're listening to the audio version, go down, hit the five stars, help this thing climb up the charts. And if you're over on YouTube, if you could like, subscribe to the channel maybe leave us a comment in there to show some engagement really do appreciate that 
as well. We will tweet out any additional bets that get made to our accounts. I probably will have one more addition somewhere along the way. And any of these head to heads I end up pulling the trigger on, I'll put on the Twitter machine as well or over in the Discord. So be sure and join the Discord lines.com upper right hand corner. You can get in on the Discord. For Steven, I am Matt. Good luck on all your US Open bets.